Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third Art is Resistance Artist Conversation with the Justice, Reentry, and Healthcare Virtual Summit. On behalf of the Institute for Community Justice, I'd like to thank PhillyCam and uh, all the rest of our sponsors for making this possible. So um, I just want to repeat sort of what I said last time because I think it's really important. Almost any successful movement to change the world has been associated in some way with art and personal expression. We can't imagine how the world ought to change without being rooted in the experiences of people most affected by the elements that need to be changed. And we can't accurately reflect on where we are as a society without seeing and feeling the memories and dreams of people who might otherwise be marginalized from having an impact on the world. These are vital roles that art provides for movements of change and why art is not only relevant, but essential to the work of ending mass incarceration and seeking justice and reentry. So today we have an artist who has been personally impacted by mass incarceration and a representation from an organization that works with people who have been impacted. And so how it's going to go is first, each of our organizations and artists, so that's the two of you, will have um, about five minutes to talk about their work or their organization. Then we'll have a conversation about the work, artist processes, and sort of organization community involvement. And during this conversation, we can take some questions from the audience. Uh, we'll show the images by these artists, and we'll also have some images from one artist, uh, Todd Holdfelter, who uh, couldn't be with us today, unfortunately. Um, but we'll have these images show in a slideshow during this artist conversation. Uh, however, I encourage everyone to visit our website uh, to look at the artwork closer up. Um, first, I'd like to, uh, to introduce um, Susie Subways. Uh, Susie currently leads Prison Health News. Prison Health News is an information network project. Their newsletter, published four times a year for people in prison, strives to lift up the voices, experience, and expertise of currently and formerly incarcerated people. They respond to requests for health information from people in prisons and jails everywhere in the United States. With the radical power informa of information, they work to break down prison walls and build health and social justice for all. Prison Health News is produced by a Philadelphia-based collective of editors and includes the work of imprisoned artists and writers. Readers are living inside a system that denies them prevention tools and treatment information about HIV, hepatitis, and other health issues. They are dealing with medical neglect, daily humiliation driven by intense stigma, and their destruction of their communities by mass imprisonment. The pieces in this gallery are done by two individuals currently involved with Prison Health News, Michael Roberson and Joe Vanderford, who are currently incarcerated. Um, and now uh, I'd like to lead on Susie, who can talk a little bit more about uh, Prison Health News, and uh, Michael and Joe. Hello, um, thank you for having me. Um, it's really an honor um, uh, to represent these two artists and also to be invited by Marlon. Um, Prison Health News was started by John Bell and Laura McTie, who Jane just mentioned also had started ICJ. Um, yeah, so we've been um, putting out this newsletter nationally um, for almost 20 years. Um, and now we are our own organization of all volunteers. Um, so yeah, we have about 5,000 subscribers who are all in prison um, across the country, mostly in state prisons, but some federal. Um, yeah, so, um, so Joe Vanderford um, is, Oh yeah. So actually, what what you're seeing right now is a piece by um, by Michael Roberson. So I picked the two of them to send their contact info to Marlon, and Marlon graciously reached out to them. Um, I, you know, they're they're two of my favorite artists who work with us at Prison Health News. Um, Michael Roberson um, is in Georgia. Um, he's been in prison in Georgia for about ten years. Um, he's about fifty years old. Um, and he, he says, I'm not as gifted as some, but I do my best. I'm so thankful for a lot of things and this being one of them. I would love to take you up on your offer. Oh, this is because we pay, we pay our artists in prison. We don't pay artists or writers on the outside, but we do pay about $25 for a small piece of art or $75, no wait, $75 for an article, $50 for a large piece of art, usually one that goes on the cover. So that goes a long way in prison, although commissary is very expensive, but they can buy some art supplies possibly, hopefully, <laughs> you know, it de depends on where they're at, right? So our, our, our readers and our artists and writers are all over the country. So it's different in different states and different facilities, what they're allowed to actually have. Um, 
actually right here as a bonus, this is something, a card that this gentleman made for us. This is actually thread that he sewed into the shape of a heart. And I was like, wow, he's got access to needle and thread. So it's different in different places. Anyway, tangent. But um, okay, so he said, so this is Michael Roberson. He says, if you put any money on my books, I would not get it because I owe the state for medical help and for indigent postage and indigent supplies. So basically they're taking out any money that he gets, they're taking out uh, a lot to actually pay for co-pays for his health care, um, which is really a shame. <laughs> and um, and so he asked me to send his writer, his artist payment to a friend of his who sent him a food package because the food is really terrible in prison and it will destroy your health. It will give you diabetes and hypertension and all the other things. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, yeah, so I just love his art mainly because of the detail. And I personally love color, but as you can see, we can't really... Um, we're just in black and white, so it's unfortunate for some of our artists that we can't print their art in color, um, and it has to be very small. But we're a very low-budget operation. We're all volunteers, uh, but we try to make the art look as good as it, as it can to do it justice. Um, but um, anyway, okay, so the other artist is Joe Vanderford. He's a trans man who is um, a transgender man who is 52 years old. He's, he's done 33 years in prison, so he was locked up when he was 19. And he's actually up for parole. He's been uh, eligible for parole since 2004, and he's actually up for parole on Tuesday. Is it, yeah, Tuesday the 13th. Um, so let's cross our fingers. And also you can send, um, I don't know if there's a way I can share this link, but <clears throat> there's actually a, a web page that you can go to, and I'll tell you how to write a letter for him. Um, a letter to the parole board, and we certainly sent him sent a letter on his behalf um, asking for his parole. So he says he's cautiously optimistic. So about um, about Joe Vanderford's art, um, there's one that that is a peacock that he is just this beautiful peacock that he drew that says um, that has like um, symbol like queer symbols on it, and also is is like um, there's a trans symbol, there's a lesbian symbol, like love, you know, between genders, all genders, and then there's um, the peacock is holding a golden key, and there's a golden um, cage um, that has a door open. It's like a bird cage with the door open. And so what Joe said about this is that this artwork is about love, uh, how love is for everyone. Um, he also created a maze that like that just shows some of the many challenges that people can experience while they're in prison. So he's in a women's prison because he's a trans man. Um, and so he's he's really witnessed a lot of the experiences that the women have in prison um, and their health issues and trying to stay in touch with their loved ones. Um, there's there's the one um, also Joe did an art uh, artwork about um, George Floyd and um, it's um, it's a picture of someone who's incarcerated, who um, has their mouth sewn shut, um, and it says 8:46, which is the, the number of minutes that the cop um, stood on George Floyd's neck or uh, kneeled on his neck. Um, it's a, it's a pretty intense image, and um, you know Joe is from Minnesota, so um, he's he was very uh, disturbed by what happened. To George Floyd, so he says this. This artwork is about George Floyd, and America is a prison nation, a prison nation. But we can't talk about police killing blacks. Um, so it's just like that's why the mouth is shown shut because it's just the the, the silencing. Okay, I gave myself a five minute timer about it, but um, yeah. So just a little bit more about Joe. He um, oh yeah, he also did another uh, piece that's a figure next to a chasm with the ball and chain that's a clock. So that's like, you know, just the question of time and how people experience time in prison. Time is actually part of the punishment or how the punishment is even framed. So yeah, so um, uh, anyway, also I was gonna say, um, Prison Health News needs volunteers. So we always need volunteers. I'm on Facebook, you can find me Susie Subways. There's only one Susie Subways with the S on the end. Um, yeah, so I, I would just say that the artwork, you know, for the people that we work with, it's it for them. It's it's about meaning, knowledge, and connection. And um, 
So I'm very, very proud and honored to, um, to be here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susie. Um, yeah, and we'll have a little bit more time to sort of go into maybe talking about each of the, the specific pieces of art as well as sort of some of the, the other work that, that Prison Health News does sort of in the conversation that we have. Uh, but, but now, uh, finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Suave Gonzalez. Um, through his colorfully confrontational works, Philadelphia artist and activist Suave Gonzalez provide, proves the political power of art. Gonzalez is a self-taught street muralist and artist, working mostly with acrylic and mixed media. After serving 31 years in prison, Gonzalez is extremely proud of his participation in Morton Contemporary as he currently embarks upon his first official exhibition in a private art gallery. He was the former director of the New Stop Resource Center, an organization which offers assistance to individuals transitioning from prison to life outside, prison life to life outside, excuse me. Gonzalez was a 2014 TED Talk presenter, a 2018 Philadelphia TEDx presenter, and a 2018 Reimagining Reentry Fellow through Mural Arts Philadelphia. He is the co-host of From the Ivory Tower to the Street, a Justice Conversation on USALA Radio, and teaches a course at the University of Pennsylvania. Gonzalez's art mirrors his advocacy work, critical of injustice, but exploding with compassion for those forced to carry its burden. Suave Gonzalez was born to create, and his drive to do so is boundless. So, Suave, take it away. Um, thank you for having me here. Y'all hear me? Yeah. Can y'all hear me? Thank mm -hmm. you for having me here. It's an honor. Again, my name is Suave Gonzalez. I served 31 years as a juvenile lifer in the state of Pennsylvania. And for me, art was my survival, um, was my survival. You know, being put as a child in a prison cell and being told that you would never get out of prison, you're going to die in prison. I had to get my voice out. And the only way I knew how to get my voice out was through art. In prison, we're not allowed to assemble, we're not allowed to gather and protest, but we're allowed to paint. So what I did, I mastered the art of painting and I just started protesting prison issues through my art. Obviously, up on release, some of my subjects have changed, but nevertheless, they're still the same. I just got better with it. And when I was in, I remember being in solitary confinement and the only thing I could do was paint. And I had no water, I had no watercolors, I had no acrylic. So I started painting with coffee, with coffee grounds. And I was just doing images and pictures with coffee grounds on paper, as a cardboard, whatever I could use as art, I use. You know, and some of my best pieces that I created while I was in the inside were created using request slips and cash slips and medical slips. Mm -hmm. Where I tape them all together with glue, um, with with toothpaste, and just paint on them. These are pieces that you're probably not going to see nowhere else because nobody out here is using that type of material to paint. But we was painting because of the struggle. We was painting because we needed to get the message out. And based on that, we managed to create a a restorative justice program in conjunction with the Mural Arts Program of Philadelphia. And we managed to create 52 murals from inside the prison SCI gratitude for, for the city of Philadelphia. And I say this, no artist in the city of Philadelphia has managed to create that many murals. And those murals were being painted by 18 lifers. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know when they, when they see these murals, they see, oh, they're beautiful pieces of art, but they don't know what went into it. The sacrifice that we had to that we had to put into it. The begging that we had to, had to beg the prison system to let us paint murals. and But nevertheless, we managed to paint the first city murals outside the city limits coming from SCI Gratisville. And that program still exists. That's why art to me means everything. Everything. If it wasn't for art, I would not be where I'm at today. I truly believe that. Art transformed my life period you know and everything i do today in my community in one way or another involve arts cool thank you so much those are just so amazing like 
yeah, no, those are some amazing, um, like, just, you know, anecdotes of how, like, you know, just getting started doing art in jail and in prison and how, like, how it's so difficult even just to get the supplies. So then you got to make do with what you have, you know, just to, to, to express yourself. And so then, you know, that's just really inspirational. Um, and I, anyway, and, and like I to, say it was not, yeah. and let me finish. Let me, let me just say this. We wasn't doing art just for self. We was doing art to give a voice to other people in the prison system mm. because in the prison that I was at, which it was gratis for, uh, art, it, art was major in the prison. So when we painted a mural, we did not paint a mural just for us. We painted a mural for 5,000 other individuals that had something to say mm. to the community but couldn't. So we had a whole lot of um, um, baggage to carry when we, when we represented our art. That's why if you look at some of the images that came out of SEI gratis for, there were images that told a story. For a lot of people, they just view it as public art. It was just that. But for the people that know the stories behind it and who was painting them, they were political murals. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to open it up with sort of just like a prompt for conversation, um, just, you know, in light of current events. Um, so uh, what role do you feel that, that your work or the work of artists that you work with or community work that you do plays in the movement for black lives that we've seen emerge forcefully across the country this past year to reform or completely revamp the role of the justice system and, and mass incarceration? Well, me as an artist, I say that our role is to bring people together. A lot of time, people don't want to have these hard conversations mm -hmm. of racism in America, racism in the penal system. But when they see art, it gives you an opportunity to to crack the ice and open that door and have that conversation. You know, and I believe that artists play a very important role in the movement. If you look at any movement, all you see is art. When you see people mm -hmm. holding their signs up, that's art. When you see people painting on their t-shirts, that's art. When you see people mm -hmm. writing on their body, that's art. So artists play a very important role. And we as artists should never forget the struggle. Because mm -hmm. when we forget the struggle and go commercial, that's when we lose our integrity. Mm -hmm. For me, even though I'm represented by one of the most respected galleries in Philadelphia, my art still speak about the struggle. I would never, as an artist, sell out for a dollar. You know, if you like my art, so be it. If you don't, so be it. It's cool. It's cool. But I would never, I would never change the message. And the message is that we have a whole lot of people that don't have a voice, that don't have a platform, that we must speak for them even if it's through our art, you, whatever medium that you use, whether it's media, radio, writing, poetry, you must always remember, there's a whole lot of people that don't have a voice that we have to give a voice to. That's what the movement is all about. Definitely, well said. Um, I would say, you know, first of all, I want to say I love that painting behind you, Suave. It's just gorgeous. Um, so, uh, yeah, about prison health news, like, yeah, it's there. We we try really hard not to censor ourselves. Um, we often do get censored by the prison systems as we send in our newsletter, um, and so it's like we would have to have a real discussion if we were going to print um, the artwork that Joe did with the this this one that you're seeing right now. Um, but mainly, so we actually just try not to censor ourselves, but we try to think strategically about what is going to be the most useful. Um, like we um, we try to kind of bury the political information. So here is uh, an article we just put in we put in the summer issue about COVID nineteen, and you'll see like in the last paragraph, across the country, many people in prison are fighting for better conditions, and people are doing hunger strikes and this and that. And you know, you can actually have, these publications do get permanently banned for just even mentioning hunger strikes, which is outrageous. We also had a, um, an article that we called, um, where did it go? Some, okay, we called it Summary of Recent Events in the Community. 
So this is a timeline in which we mention um, uh, that, okay, May 19th, protesters in Minneapolis took over and burned down a police precinct. So we're actually able to slip that information in there. The fact that um, 70 immigrants detained by ICE in, in California be, began a hunger strike against racism and in the memory of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Oscar Grant, and Tony McDade. So we're just kind of, what we try to do is we highlight the movement, you know, as you, as you mentioned, the movement for Black Lives and other movements for freedom. We try to highlight what people in prison are doing so that other people in prison can read about it um, because they don't, they're not gonna hear it from anywhere else. And since we're a health publication, we can slip it in there quietly, but they'll know, oh, wow, this, this, uh, they did, basically hunger strikes are one of the most militant tools that people can use in prison because you can get thrown in the hole. You can, there's a lot of horrible retribution. So there's limited options for organizing. And we try to um, let people know because people in prison can't write to each other. They can't like start a coalition, you know, across the country or even across the state because they can't write to each other. So we try to help them in that way. Cool. Thanks. That's really interesting. I mean, just, you know, thinking about the logistics of trying to even get news of what's happening in the world to people who are behind the walls, knowing that, like, there's such strict censorship, um, let alone, like, providing sort of some, some assistance almost in, like, you know, nationwide organizing that can't actually happen. Uh, directly between people behind the walls across, like, you know, state lines, let alone just different prisons. Um, so, Suave, I actually have a, a question for you. Um, some of the work that you submitted, and it'll sort of show up, involves uh, some portraits of several sort of well-known individuals. So notably, we have images of uh, Breonna Taylor, we have Ray Charles, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and uh, our own Asada Thomas. Um, why made you choose these individuals specifically and sort of what do they represent for you and sort of your work? Well, uh, again, uh, in the recent month, I painted a hundred portraits of essential workers in the city. You know, mm -hmm. that was at the front line of the pandemic and the side of time was just, was just one of them. And mm -hmm. what made me choose these images is what they all have in connection is, is the struggle. They all, at some point in their life, you know, have to own some obstacles in front of them. For me, uh, painting Breonna Taylor was an indictment of institutional racism with the police. You know, cause even, even though it was Breonna Taylor, we see this happen all the time. She was just one of the cases that was publicized. But, I come up in, in an area where I seen the police kill people in New York. I seen the police kill people in Philadelphia and nothing come about. So painting Breonna Taylor is a more known figure because people know who she was, uh, but it's really a, a, a dedication to all the people that's been shot by the police mm. and killed. You know, painting the side of Thomas was paying homage to the people that's out in the front line, bringing awareness to these issues of social justice. You know, and for me, painting Ray Charles, knowing some of his history and some of the obstacles he had to come through, some of the discrimination he has to go through because he was blind, you know, represent my struggle. Because when you're in the prison system, you're almost like blind. You don't know what's going on in the, in the cities. You don't know what's going on in the, in the world or in the country. Because the prison system is so good and hiding information from us that that's how you feel. You feel, you feel like you're blind. And when you see it for the first time, it's almost like, wow, I can see. I'm not really blind. I can see. But that's, that's why I picked up images. And the last image I submitted um, was the image of uh, um, RGB. And the reason I painted her was because she played a role, a critical role, in the decision that ultimately freed 500 juvenile lifers in the state of Pennsylvania. Mm. And that's why I, I painted those images. Cool. No, thanks. That's really, you know, and, and also thank you for sort of reminding that you they're part of a, a bigger 
series that you did. You painted a hundred essential workers um, since COVID started, and that's sort of like the series that you've been working on for the past while. And so, you know, I've I've had the chance to see a few more of those on your Facebook, um, on your Instagram, and they're you know they're they're amazing in the same style. So I definitely encourage other folks to to check those out. Um, so a question for Susie. Uh, so you reached out to me because you developed relationships with uh, two, well, many artists, but two artists in specific whose work you thought would be good to share with the Artist Resistance Gallery, Joe Vanderford and uh, Michael Roberson. I guess, can you speak to uh, your relationship with them and kind of how you first came to, came to know them and how they first got in touch with uh, Prison Health News? Because that's, you know, definitely would be interesting just to see how those relationships are, are formed with artists behind the walls. Yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, this is actually something that we're we're discussing in, in somewhat of a self-critical way and trying to move forward because um, we haven't done much outreach um, and our, we are, our newsletter is spread through word of mouth. And so we've noticed um, just by updating our mailing list a bunch of times, we've noticed that our uh, mailing list is mostly white men and that we're not really reaching people in the women's prisons and we're not, like we're not reaching you know a lot of the populations that are most impacted by mass incarceration so that was how so how we get in touch with people is they find us and joe vanderford is is like a really serious self-starter and like super energetic person and he's in touch with a lot of organizations on the outside and so that's how we're like anyone who we're in touch with who is a woman or a trans person, usually they have done everything they could to try to reach organizations on the outside. Um, and and like, um, I, we're just gonna try and do some more targeted outreach. I know this isn't what you're asking, but it's really on my mind. We're gonna try to put advertisements in publications that are read by black and Latinx and um, Native American people in prison, you know, in particular, and um, also um, sending, I've been sending copies to prison libraries at women's facilities, um, but we need to get on top of that. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of, it's sort of random or about about that person, like whether we get in touch with them. But we do have, a, um, we have this in the, in the, on page two, write us an article or send us your art you know, we describe a bit what we're looking for. And so people can, people just send us their art and it's amazing. Um, I also have, I'm wearing this bracelet that someone also who had apparently had access to needle and thread, which I'm so pleased that sometimes people do get access to um, these materials, but they made us this bracelet that says prison health news. Um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, we get these gifts and, um, uh, you know, Michael Roberson and um, Joe Vanderford were just like two of who I thought were like the highest quality artists, like the most engaging. Uh, but that's just my personal taste, honestly. But um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. So in terms of relationships, right, it's mostly on email now, but it's not real email. They just have like this really janky um, prison profiteer system that like a private company makes a lot of money off of and you go on their web that website and they ask you like they ask you for your social security number and all this and you sign up and then you um are in touch with this person in a way that the prison system can mon monitor what you're saying but at any rate it's much quicker than snail mail which is our main our means of communication is still the mail but um with joe i've been emailing with him a lot the past few months um especially because his parole is coming up and I wrote, we wrote a letter of support for him and he sends me a lot of jokes and he also tells me about the health issues that the women in his facility are dealing with. Um, and, and yeah, so we've actually been corresponding a lot. Um, Michael Roberson, I've, I've just been in touch with him about like, thank you for your art and can we send you some money for that? Um, that's about it. Yeah. No, yeah, that's that's great. And like, you know, yeah, definitely speaking to that, like sort of email system, it is for sure like the pr pr prison profiteering system, I know, because I've had to be in, in touch with them. And it is like, you know, you can you have to pay like, you know, I don't know, 50 cents for a stamp, quote unquote, like to like send an email. So it's like, okay, you don't have to pay to send an email like that's not not a thing, but they just made it up like, you know, how can we get more money? Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, thank you. And, uh, so 
Well, well, on, well, on the, um, can I, yeah, can yeah. I mention something real quick? Let me mention something. Now that you talk about money, um, at one time in the prison system, right? If you was an artist and you engage and you enroll in one of these art class in the prison system and you sold your piece, the prison system would take 20% of your money. Hmm. Wow. They stopped that. They stopped that a few years ago, but at one time they was doing that. So, and it shows this is how powerful art is, you know, mm. that I'll give you a piece of canvas and some pencils, but if you sell that work, since we gave you the material, we're going to take 20% of your profit. Plus right. what you owe, plus the restitution you owe and whatever fines. So, you know, uh, uh, the prison system always find ways to, to make money off of, of the bodies they house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. No, that reminds me just of what you were saying in your opening, Susie, about how um, you can't just send money directly to uh, Michael Roberson. And that's like, thanks for reminding me of that. So then like when we send sort of our, our check to him, we don't just send it directly to him because it'll just get taken by the prison system as like, you know, co-pays for medical care. So, you know, that's, you know, something that I hadn't even thought of, but of course they'll find some other way to, to take the money. Um, I want to uh, ask a question of uh, Suave now, which is, uh, so ICJ has, uh, has worked with you for a while now with like, you know, you've sort of contributed to the artist resistance gallery like a few times. Uh, and we definitely enjoy this part like the partnership to help share the art and contribute to the conversation around ending mass incarceration. Um, I guess, can you speak a little bit to, like of your side to like that partnership as well as like how the like conversation has moved and movement has, has grown over the time since you've been like working with us and sort of sharing your work through our gallery? Well, um, November 20th will be three years for me since I've been home. Mm. And when I first came home, um, I was involved with an organization called Art for Justice, and mm. they enrolled me into the Art and Resistance um, at the convention yeah. center. So I said, sure, I'll do it. Yeah. And I met in person the side of Thomas. We always mm. knew who she was in name, because her name mm. ring bells in the prison system as mm. a go-to person. But meeting her in person and the way she embraced me, into the organization like I was there on, and whatever you need let's do this you know it made me feel like I got to get involved with this organization I love what they do I love who they represent and I love the integrity they do it with so I had no choice but to create that partnership and when she calls I'm gonna answer the phone mm -hmm. because I know that she's calling to represent a body of man that don't have a voice. And that's what I love about this, this partnership, that we give voice to the voiceless. You know, and at the same time, um, I will be remiss not to mention that uh, y'all gave me my first opportunity, my first opportunity coming home from prison to exhibit my work. And my work at the first show that y'all gave me and allow me to be part with some of the work that I've done in the prison. Mm. I, until then, nobody knew who I was at all. And because of that one opportunity, you know, I managed, I managed to have my own show at the International House. I managed to become a, 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 a Art for Justice Fellowship. I've managed to travel to different universities across the country speaking about art and incarceration. I've managed to network with the people that I've met at that show and, and mm -hmm. build relationships that are still going on today. So, you know, it, it, to me, it's like that gave me an opportunity. And this is what we're supposed to do when people come home. We embrace them. You've done your time. You serve your time. Now let's 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 get started on rebuilding your life. And also, like a shot of Thomas is someone that I could call any time of the day or night, and she will return the call for any advice. For any advice. You know, so I hope that one day I could become 
a little bit of what she has and offered the community because it's it's outstanding it's outstanding the way she embraced not only me but people coming home and make them and make them feel as if we part of that community and that's wow. why i'm involved with icj hmm. thanks no thank you i mean that's um you know great words uh for for us and we're we're super pleased to like have been able to give you that like platform because your work is definitely just incredibly beautiful and just like you know powerful in the sort of message that it presents and the way that it presents it you know so per like personally i'm really glad that you're part of this uh this uh gallery and that you have been for the last one as well um so we're we're reaching uh, somewhat close to the end of our time because uh, we got we got started a little late, uh, but I'll sort of continue for a little bit longer. Um, I guess uh, Susie, so you you'd mentioned uh, Joe Vanderford's parole hearing um, coming up uh, in a little bit, and I know that that's something that that he had spoken to me about, and like sort of wanting to make sure that everyone watching knew how to like share their support. And so you've kind of seen some of his, his work, like to, to the audience watching this stream, we've seen some of his work uh, pass through here uh, on the screen. And um, if you want to support, like sort of read it, read more into his story, can you sort of let people know where, where they can go for that and like how they can support? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, yeah, so some of his supporters on the outside um, started a Facebook page for him. Um, it's just Free Joe Vanderford. So it's those three words, Free Joe Vanderford is V-A-N-D-E-R-F-O-R-D. -E so there's this Facebook page um, uh, that you can like, you know, and you'll get updates about him. Um, and then on there, there's also the information, the link to the Google Doc that tells you how to write a letter. I think you can probably send a letter to the parole board up until Tuesday. If anyone has time to do that, um, that would be awesome. Um, there's also, I think, a, um, yeah, I think that that's, if you're not on Facebook, um, there is, I think, a website as well. Um, Oh yeah. Okay. So if you just go to tinyurl.com, um, okay. This is the information about the parole letter. This is awesome. Okay. So tiny URL, cause the, the link was just extremely long and I couldn't tell you, but it's tinyurl.com parole Joe 2020. So after the dot com, there's a, a slash mark and then it's just parole Joe 2020. So some, a lot of information about him and his case and stuff there. Cool. Thank you. And uh, to everyone also, if you want to, again, look a little bit more at any of these uh, pieces that are scrolling uh, and just look at them by by name, uh, definitely go to, um, you can find them at uh, fight.org, go to like the upcoming events tab, and you should see one of the events is day three art is resistance uh, gallery. And then you'll see the three artists who are displayed today. Um, listed there and you can just look down you can see their social media you can see some websites you can see the website of uh, prison health news also the parole joe link is there uh links to uh to suave's social media are there too um yeah so i mean this has been a really great uh conversation my sort of closing question i feel like you all answered perfectly which is just like you know speaking to the role of artists like engaging with like the wider community sort of like what's the role of art and artists in sort of within the community right because a lot of times we see art as just like it's like a thing that's not presented at least like in schools or in like sort of messaging that we get from the world as like an essential thing but I truly like believe that that's not the case I think art is absolutely essential and I wonder if, if uh, the two of you can sort of speak a little bit to like, you know, the role of artists, like the essential role in their communities. I mean, I started off. I think that the essential role for artists is to listen mm. to the people in the community and bring their message in the most explicit way possible mm -hmm. to the masses through art. That is our role. 
our, our, our role should not be, I don't like what you're saying or I disagree with your politics. As an artist, I don't care what your politics is. I care about the message and what message are we going to present to the masses because we have a responsibility to be that vehicle for the people in the community. Mm. You know, artists are like new, are like newspaper. We listen, we take the information in, we go back into the lab and we create that message that you just conveyed to us and a big masterpiece, however you want to call it, a collage, watercolors, acrylic. I mean, anything you want to use to bring that message. But our role should be to listen to the community and make sure that we are representing the message in the most explicit way, whether your feelings are hurt or not. I'm going to show you how these people feel about the police. And that's that's our role. We are messengers. We should be messengers. Thank you. And I don't know, Susie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, like Suave said it all. Um, I, you know, I, I love to quote um, Tony, Tony K. Bambara. She said, our job is to make revolution irresistible. So I'm a writer, I'm not an artist. So I can't, it's not my place so much, but I would say that, um, you know, cultural workers, you know, we can make the revolution irresistible. We can make social change and getting involved irresistible because we can show visions of a better world. We can show the outrage. We can show the pain that people are feeling in a way that people can, other people can viscerally identify with across the prison walls. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a beauty, the beauty of art allows us to open our minds to information that's, that can be very painful. So I feel like um, I really appreciate all the artists who are part of this movement. Cool. Well, I mean, it's like you, John uh, Lewis said. Yes. It's like John Lewis said, let's make, for artists, let's make a little trouble. Let's cause mm -hmm. a little trouble. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have to be watered down. This we, we could keep it 100 and cause mm -hmm. a little trouble through the art. Let's shake the tree. Amazing. Definitely. I'm 100% I'm there. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Susie and to Suave for your sort of great words and your, um, like, you know, talking about your work and your organization and what you do. Um, thank you for the work that you do. And... Uh, Thanks for being a part of this uh, this gallery and this talk. Um, so at uh, one o'clock today, we have um, the final workshop of um, the Justice Reentry and Healthcare Summit. It is a panel discussion uh, called the Culture of Health, and it'll be a discussion between five uh, professionals in the field of uh, mental health and uh, talking about you know mental health, like just health in general, talking about the importance of sort of developing a culture of health, like, especially during these sort of difficult times, like, you know, we need to be able to take care of ourselves, we need to, like, you know, do the things that we have to do to, you know, make sure that we're strong and healthy, both physically, mentally, spiritually, all the rest. So stay tuned. Uh, it'll be starting at one o'clock. Uh, you'll actually have to register for the one o'clock session if you haven't done so already. Um, you've probably gotten some links to do that, but if not, you can find them on the fight.org website slash upcoming events tab, look for culture of health and uh, click through the link that says register. Um, yeah, you know, otherwise uh, stay tuned, half an hour. Thanks everyone. <laughs>